Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, and something is wrong with me. Oh, well, nothing's wrong with you in my opinion. Aw, thanks, Katie. Everything is right with me. <laughs> Moving on to the rolling rehash. <laughs> <laughs> Last week, we covered the first half of Chapter 9, The Dark Mark, and the corresponding film scenes. Arthur subscribed to the belief that what Molly doesn't know about the twins' gambling habits won't hurt him. Is it chaos and mayhem? Just an Irish celebration? Or C, all of the above? Draco not only fails at delivering a decent insult, but also has no idea what it means to have big feet. Harry luckily passed out in the most polite section of the otherwise panic-stricken stampede. Ludo Bagman's dubious exit of the forest leaves the trio with more questions than they really care to ask. And while the Death Eaters may have problematic morals, the fact that they chose to launch an attack after the Quidditch match shows that their priorities are right where they should be. During episode 71, Fred, George, Fred, our Potter pondering was, do you think that Hermione ultimately was in more danger than Harry? Quincy honestly doesn't think either of them were inherently in any danger at the moment. If what is said is true, then the Death Eaters really just got drunk and were having a bit of fun, and with that, they found some muggles to terrorize. He doesn't think they were thinking of anything else aside from the muggles, really. Juliana agrees with Quincy. At this point in time, the Death Dudes just got drunk and wanted to cause some wizard supremacy misbehavior. They wanted to show off their superiority around muggles. Later in the series, Hermione and Harry were more equally matched in who was in more danger of getting killed by Death Eaters. But, you know, Harry has a slight edge. Sarah thinks she absolutely was in more danger. She was a known muggle and a somewhat famous one because of her association with Harry at that time. Plus... Harry lost his wand, so he wouldn't have been able to help her if she got into any trouble. And Ron, well, Ron isn't exactly known for his defense against the Dark Arts at this point. That's true. Max said Harry lost his wand and killed Moldy. 100% Hermione was safer. Also, that bitch is a weapon. The Fist of Fury will unleash! Dave said no. In the books, obviously they were going after muggles, not wizards. Not even muggle-born wizards. It was clearly an impromptu mob mentality action of opportunity against the muggles that happened to be there. If they hadn't been there, I don't think anything would have happened. They wouldn't have sought out muggle-borns to humiliate like that. On the other hand, I don't think Harry was in danger either. They obviously had to go to Mr. Roberts' house to get his wife and kids, so it was a targeted attack. If they wanted to get Harry, Lucius knew where he was and they could have grabbed him instead. If they really wanted to and were willing to fight whoever tried to protect him. But that's not how it happened in the movie. No motive was ever given in the movie. But since the whole series is about Harry, we assume anything Death Eaters do is about Voldy trying to get Harry. Obviously, Voldy and Junior, with chapped lips, already had a plan for later. Mike thinks that if they were going to snatch Hermione with Harry right there, though, they probably would have snatched him too, and probably stunned Ron the other alternative being that they'd see Harry and decide that he was a bridge too far and leave them all alone. Liz said assuming the Death Eaters weren't aware of Voldy's plan for getting Harry's blood for his resurrection, Harry could have seriously been in danger of being captured. He wouldn't have been in danger of being purposely killed because they must at least know of Voldemort's wish to kill Harry himself, and the chance that Voldemort could come back someday must have still been plausible to them. Yet, If the bad guys would know of Hermione's blood status, she would have been in more danger of a serious attack or worse for sure. So it could depend on how you view it. Jackson said if the Death Eaters had gotten near her, definitely. Their hatred of Muggleborns is only second to that of Muggles. Robert thinks Lucius would have led them to attacking her since he knows that she's a Muggleborn, but doubts the rest of them knew or considered the fact that she could have been Muggleborn. As for the case of Harry, he personally doesn't think he was in threat of attack on the off chance one of them might accidentally kill instead of injure. Jessica thinks it's quite likely, since muggles and muggle-borns were targeted often. 
Those were some really good responses this week. You guys thought these out. I know, dude. Man, our keepers really do their research. Right? <laughs> Thanks for doing the legwork, guys. And I love how many different perspectives we have. Mm -hmm. It's not everybody saying or thinking the same thing. It's not even just yes or no. There's some thought in it. Yeah. You guys are smart. <laughs> and I love the fact that they will comment on each other's, too. Right. And they'll have, like, conversations about it. I love the conversations. I really do. That's the goal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Our keepers are awesome. Love you guys. <laughs> Our trivia question last week was, in what book did Hermione read about the dark mark? Back in the tents, Ron asked again for someone to explain what the skull thing was, and Hermione told him that it's you-know-who's symbol. She read about it in The Rise and Fall of the Dark Arts. Congratulations goes to, drumroll please, <laughs> Max Nash. What?! He decided to leave off the smiley face emoji this time and narrowly beat out Mike Riley and ended his six-week streak. I knew he wasn't going to let him beat his and Quincy's streak. I knew it. Especially not since Goblet of Fire is his favorite. He just couldn't. Right? But the good news is we have plenty of chapters left for Mike to pick a streak back up. It could still happen. Yep, we'll see if he makes a comeback this week or if someone else steps in. For now, let's just keep rolling into the second half of Chapter 9, The Dark Mark, and the corresponding film scenes. Chapter 9, The Dark Mark, Part 2 As the trio talk about the riot, they hear the sound of footsteps and Harry calls out, Who's there? and hears a voice yell, Mors Mordra, in response. Something large and green erupted from the darkness, flew above the trees, and manifested into a giant green skull, with a serpent protruding from its mouth. The woods all around them erupt into screams, though Harry doesn't understand why and again asks who's there. Hermione grabs his collar and pulls him backward, telling him to move and explaining that it's you-know-who's sign, the dark mark. The three of them begin to run across the clearing, but before they get too far, a series of popping sounds announces the appearance of about 20 wizards, surrounding them with their wands pointed at the trio. Harry yells, duck, and pulls the other two to the ground as the 20 voices yell, stupefy. A flash of spells sweeps over the clearing until Mr. Weasley recognizes his son and yells for them to stop. He goes to check on the kids and a cold voice tells him to get out of the way. Mr. Crouch angrily asks which of them conjured the dark mark, and Harry and Ron deny doing anything. Crouch accuses them of lying, shouting that they have been discovered at the scene of the crime. Another witch tries to point out that they're just kids, and Mr. Weasley asks them where the dark mark came from. Hermione points in the direction where they heard the voice, and mentions that they heard someone shout an incantation. Mr. Crouch turns his accusation towards her, but the rest of the ministry members turn towards the trees. The witch figures they are too late, but Amos Diggory thinks there's a chance their stunners could have hit them, and he marches towards the trees. A few seconds later, he shouts that he's found someone unconscious, and a shocked Mr. Crouch asks who it is. Mr. Diggory emerges from the trees carrying a stunned house elf and lays her at an even more shocked Mr. Crouch's feet. He recognizes her as his house elf, Winky, and says it cannot be before marching off to the trees himself, despite Mr. Diggory's assurance that no one else was there. While Crouch searches the trees, Mr. Diggory comments on how embarrassing it is. When Mr. Weasley tries to point out that it couldn't be the elf since it requires a wand, Mr. Diggory says that she had a wand and holds it up for them to see. At this moment, Ludo Bagman apparates in and Mr. Crouch returns. Bagman gets caught up on the situation, and Diggory wakes the elf to question her about the dark mark. Winky insists that she didn't do it, and Mr. Diggory tells her that she was found with a wand in her hand. He holds up the wand again, and Harry recognizes it as his own wand, and explains that he dropped it. Briefly thinking that Harry was confessing to throwing it aside after conjuring the dark mark, Mr. Weasley sets him straight and he goes back to interrogating the elf who keeps insisting that she didn't do magic with the wand. Hermione speaks up in Winky's defense, pointing out that the voice they heard was much deeper than Winky's voice, and Ron and Harry back her up. Mr. Diggory decides to use prior incantato on Harry's wand, and a shadow of the dark mark erupts from it. 
He deletes the image and looks down at the elf, who continues to insist she didn't do it and is a good elf. Arthur again tries to point out that it's unlikely she had done it since few wizards know the spell. Where would she have learned it? Crouch coldly speaks up to say that perhaps Amos is suggesting he routinely teaches his servants to conjure the dark mark. Mr. Diggory begins to backtrack as Crouch continues on, pointing out that he's come very close to accusing the two people least likely to conjure the mark, Harry Potter and himself. Mr. Diggory tries to say he wasn't suggesting he had anything to do with it and said the elf could have picked it up anywhere. Mr. Weasley agrees, but means about the wand and kindly asks Winky where she found it. She points over towards the trees, and Mr. Diggory switches tactics, asking if she saw anyone. Trembling, she tells them that she is seeing no one, and Crouch asks Diggory if he could be allowed to deal with his elf, instead of her being taken in for questioning, and assures him that she will be punished. Winky starts crying as her master says that this means close. Hermione tries to stand up for Winky again, but Mr. Crouch says he has no use for a house elf who disobeys him. Following an awkward silence, Mr. Weasley announces that he's going to take his lot back to the tent and asks for Harry's wand back. As they all head back towards the campgrounds, Hermione asks what will happen to Winky, furious at how they were treating her. She and Ron bicker about it until Mr. Weasley cuts them off, telling them that they need to get back to the tent quickly. Ron asks about the skull thing, and his dad says he will explain once they're back at the tent. At the edge of the woods, they meet up with some frightened witches and wizards, and Mr. Weasley assures them that the mark was not him, and excuses himself to take the kids back to the tents. When they arrive, Charlie pokes his head out and checks on things, saying Fred, George, and Ginny made it back, and Mr. Weasley says he has the others. They duck into the tent, and Bill asks if they got the person who conjured the mark. Mr. Weasley explains about finding Barty Crouch's elf with Harry's wand, and Percy indignantly insists that Mr. Crouch is quite right to get rid of an elf like that. Hermione snaps at Percy, and Ron cuts off their argument by asking what the big deal about the skull thing is. Mr. Weasley tells them about how back when you-know-who was powerful, he and his followers set the mark whenever they killed, and coming home and finding it over your home was everyone's worst fear. Bill said it didn't help tonight, though, because it scared off all the Death Eaters before they could catch them, though they did save the Roberts family. Harry asks what Death Eaters are, and Bill explains that it's what you-know-who's supporters call themselves. Mr. Weasley says they don't know for sure it was them, though it likely was, and Harry wonders what the point of it was. Giving a hollow laugh, Mr. Weasley tells him that it was just fun for them. Ron wonders why they would have run from his mark if they were his supporters, and Bill points out that they told all sorts of lies about being forced to kill and torture people to stay out of Azkaban, and he bets they'd be more frightened to see him come back than most. Hermione asks if the person who cast the dark mark did it to show support or scare them off, and Mr. Weasley admits that it could have been either, but that only a Death Eater knows how to conjure it, so they at least had to have been a Death Eater at one point. He then tells them they better get some sleep so they can catch an early port key to get home, before Mrs. Weasley worries too much. Though wide awake with his head buzzing about everything that has happened since he woke up with his scar burning, Harry wonders if Sirius has gotten his letter yet and stares up at the canvas of the tent until he manages to doze off. The movie scene starts on a man kicking debris as he saunters through the destruction, before pausing to point his wand at the sky and yell, More's Mordra! A jet of light flies up and erupts into an ethereal image of a green skull with a snake protruding from its mouth. The camera cuts to a close-up on the man as he grimaces at the symbol before showing Harry waking up. Harry looks around the deserted and burned campsite and sees the man, who stalks toward him. Harry takes off running, and before the man gets too close, Hermione and Ron yell Harry's name and scare him off. They manage to find him, saying that they've been looking for him for ages. Harry notices the green skull in the night sky and asks what it is. Before anyone can answer, he feels a pain in his scar, and several wizards apparate in, surrounding the trio, and attempt to stupefy them as they duck. Mr. Weasley comes running up, telling the men to stop because that's his son. 
He pushes past another wizard to approach the kids and check if they are okay. He is closely followed by Mr. Crouch, who points his wand at the three teenagers and asks which of them conjured it. Mr. Weasley insists that they couldn't have, but Crouch is sure they are lying, saying they were discovered at the scene of the crime. Harry is confused about what he means by crime, and Hermione explains that the symbol is the dark mark. It's his mark. Without thinking, Harry says, what, Voldemort? And Crouch looks up at the sky. Harry asks about the people in masks, wondering if they are his too. And Mr. Weasley nods, saying, Death Eaters. Mr. Crouch seems to accept that the kids didn't conjure the mark, and asks everyone to follow him. Before he walks away, Harry tells him about the man from before, and points in the direction he saw him. They run off, leaving Mr. Weasley with Harry, Ron, and Hermione. He asks Harry who it was, and Harry says that he doesn't know he didn't see his face. They all look up at the dark mark. The camera focuses on it as the snake continues to slither, protruding from the mouth of the green skull as the scene ends. So once again, we're looking at a significantly streamlined. Significantly. I'd say about half of this section of the book chapter was just completely left out. Like more than half, I'd say, but yeah. In the book, the trio hears footsteps and Harry calls out, who's there? From the darkness, a voice yells, Mors Mordra. And something large and green slithers up through the trees and into the sky. Yeah, in the movie, Harry is still out cold in a burned up campsite. Aw, they're past tense. No. Lighten up, you're too tense. Oh my God. No. <laughs> Just trying to diffuse the tension. Stop it. <laughs> but all's fire and puns and podcasting. Pitch, please. <laughs> Katie made a camping pun. <laughs> Welcome to the dark side. If you can't beat him, join him. But anyways, in the movie, we see a man kicking shit aside as he saunters through what's left of the campsite. He stops, points his wand at the sky, and yells, Mors Mordra! So, we blatantly see who casts Mors Mordra in the movie, even though we don't actually know who he is at this point in the book. Because it only had a voice in the darkness. Then, because fuck mystery, we get a close-up on the man as he sneers up at the symbol before the camera cuts back to Harry as he is waking up. Obviously, in the book, Harry isn't knocked out. Or alone. He sees the symbol in the sky and thinks it's another leprechaun display until he notices the greenish smoke is a large skull with a serpent coming out of its mouth, like a tongue. And why would the leprechauns do that? I mean, it's a lesser known Irish thing, but I... I, I... <laughs> Really just don't see why they would use it, honestly. <laughs> In the movie, Harry looks around and sees the man, who begins to pursue him. Harry runs away, and before long, Hermione and Ron call out his name, and the man runs off. They find him, and Harry sees the green skull in the night sky and asks what it is. In the book, screams erupt all throughout the woods, and Hermione has to drag a confused Harry away from where they were, telling him that it's the dark mark, the sign of you-know-who. Before the three can get very far, a group of 20 wizards appear surrounding them, each with their wand out. The movie has this part somewhat similar, actually. Before Hermione has a chance to answer Harry's question about the symbol, he grimaces and touches his scar. Then several wizards apparate in and surround them. In the book, Harry yells for Ron and Hermione to duck and pulls them down with him, just before the group of wizards all yell stupefy as the lights from the spell bounce this way and that. Mr. Weasley yells for them to stop. That's his son. <laughs> and once again, the movie is actually very similar. The wizards attempt to stupefy them as they duck and Mr. Weasley runs up and yells for them to stop because that's his son. And I mean, damn, they're all stupefy first, ask questions about who they are later. Details, shmeetails. In both... Mr. Weasley approaches them to see if they're okay, and Mr. Crouch pushes past him, angrily demanding to know which of them conjured the dark mark. Ron and Harry exclaim that they didn't do anything. Mr. Crouch shouts that they've been found at the scene of the crime, and Mr. Weasley asks them who did conjure it. Hermione points to where they heard the voice, and said that a voice from there had said the incantation. In the movie, Mr. Weasley comes to their defense more than asks follow-up questions about what they do know. But Crouch is sure they're lying, saying that they were discovered at the scene of the crime! The sentiment is the same as in the book, mm -hmm. because Mr. Crouch is incredulous, 
But the other ministry wizards believe the three children are innocent and point their wands in the direction which Hermione had pointed. I mean, like any logical person would do. Right. (laughs) One witch says whoever it was would have disapparated already, but Mr. Diggory says there's a chance that they may have gotten them, raises his wand, and marches into the darkness. Yeah, Mr. Diggory's not even in this part in the movie. (laughs) Yeah, so they couldn't have done that. No. A few seconds later, he shouts that he found somebody and comes out of the trees holding a small limp figure that Harry recognizes at once is Winky the house elf. Yeah, Winky who? Right? Um, yeah, I don't know any Winky. Sorry, doesn't ring a bell. Well, Winky is Mr. Crouch's house elf. What? And he stands there stunned, just completely in disbelief, and then says this cannot be and walks over to where Mr. Diggory had found her. The others hear his rustling about in the leaves in the bushes while they discuss Winky. Amos Diggory thinks it's embarrassing that it was Barty Crouch's house elf, and when Mr. Weasley says that the sign requires a wand, Mr. Diggory says she had one. What? What? That's crazy! Wonder where she got it. Where'd she get a wand from? Movie doesn't tell us. Uh, Movie doesn't even have her, so (laughs) yeah. Another popping sound is heard, and Ludo Bagman reappears, panting as he asks a series of questions about what's going on with the dark mark and who cast it. Johnny come lately over here. Jesus. (laughs) So useless. Right? Once again, though, really wish we could have seen James Corden do this. Right? (laughs) Mr. Crouch returns empty-handed, but he's very pale. And Bagman asks him where he was during the game, because Winky had been saving him a seat, and then he notices Winky on the ground and asks what happened to her. So oblivious. Yeah, he's just... He has no idea what's going on from moment to moment, does he? Not even a little bit. (laughs) Mr. Crouch says he's been busy, and his elf has been stunned. After a moment, Bagman finally puts two and two together and comes up with Winky was found with the wand that conjured the dark mark. (laughs) Boy, way to play connect the dots, Bagman. Damn. Way to join the club late there. Yeah, welcome. Mr. Diggory says that he'd like to hear what she has to say for herself, and Mr. Crouch doesn't say anything, so he takes that as permission and points his wand at Winky and uses Renovate to wake her back up. I think I could use that right now. (laughs) (laughs) We'll work on that one. Yeah, definitely. Winky wakes up, shakily sitting up and slowly looking up and around before bursting into terrified sobs. Poor Winky. This would have been so heartbreaking to watch. Uh, Right? I would have loved to see it. Especially because the only thing that we know of house elves at this point is Dobby. And Dobby only did things for good reasons. Especially since a lot of what he was used for was comedy. Mm -hmm. There were the sad things where he had to like beat himself up if he did something wrong. But yeah, that was still done with more humor, like beating himself with a lamp. Yeah. And so, like, it was physical comedy more than it was, like, this is fucked up. Yeah, the grunting and the yeah. having to hide him in the closet because he's too busy beating himself with a lamp. And, yeah. But this is, like, just sad. <laughs> yeah, this is full on sad. And they didn't bother including it because who needs emotion in a movie? Sure. New all. <laughs> New all. <laughs> Mr. Diggory tells her that he's a member of the Department of the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures and that she's been discovered right under where the Dark Mark had been conjured. Winky says she didn't do it and doesn't know how. Mr. Diggory says that she had been found with a wand and holds it out in front of her. Harry recognizes the wand and says it's his own and that he dropped it, which causes everyone to look at him. (laughs) Mr. Diggory thinks this is a confession? (laughs) Because that's the first thing I'm going to say. Yeah. Is this a confession? Yeah. You threw it aside after you conjured the mark? Dude, really? Yes, that's exactly what I did. And then I just told you about it because I'm a criminal mastermind. Clearly. Obviously. This is also another one of those things we were talking about. I mean, obviously, Diggory wasn't in this part of the movie. But how they changed his role in that scene that he interacted with Harry very kindly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in this scene, it was more of a power grab i think he just got a little carried away i don't think he was full-on being a dick but it still wasn't great it did not paint him in a very nice light no it was definitely not the dad next door kind of impression you got from the movie for sure 
But the sentiment was in the movie, though fully on Crouch, because even after he knows it's Harry Potter, he still thinks one of them conjured the Dark Mark. Like, guy, do you know who I am? Like, not to be a Draco, but do you know who my father was? (laughs) (laughs) Which is basically what Mr. Weasley chimes in with in the book. Mm -hmm. Asking Amos if he really believes that Harry Potter would conjure the Dark Mark. And then Mr. Diggory is just like, oh, yeah. (laughs) Got carried away. (laughs) Blonde moment. (laughs) Whoops. Harry explains that he realized he was missing his wand right after they got into the woods. And then Mr. Diggory starts in on Winky again, saying she must have found the wand and decided to have some fun with it. Yeah, like some fun, like conjuring an evil ass dark mark in the sky. Right, that totally makes sense there. You're still carried away, just so you know. Boy, Winky's a party animal. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) She once again denies casting the spell, saying she just picked up the wand and doesn't know how to make it. And Hermione jumps to her defense, saying that it couldn't have been her because the voice they heard was much deeper than Winky's squeaky little elf voice. I'm still so sad we missed out on Winky's squeaky little elf voice. I know. She would have been adorable. Oh my god, she would have been so cute. But Ron and Harry chime in that it was definitely not an elf, that it was a human voice. Mr. Diggory says there's an easy way to find out what the last spell cast on a wand was, touches the tip of his wand to Harry's wand tip, and says, Prior Encantado, which causes a shadow of the green skull to erupt where the wands touched. This doesn't happen in the movie. No, it doesn't, which sucks because it completely foreshadows Prior Encantado. Like, that's actually sort of really significant later on. Yeah, it's like a whole thing. And we're told what it is later. Well, vaguely, yeah. We'll talk about that when we get there. But you're just sitting there like, if you didn't read the books, you're like, what the fuck's he saying? Is that a word? Right, exactly. (laughs) Well, we'll talk more about that when we get there. Diggory quickly says Delitrius to make the second smoky skull vanish. And then he rounds on Winky yet again, saying she's been caught red-handed. And she continues to protest that she's a good elf and she doesn't use wands. I just feel so bad for Poor her. Winky. I know. At this point in the at this point in the book, Mr. Weasley speaks loudly over Mr. Diggory to tell him to think about it. Few wizards even know the spell. So where would a house elf have learned it? Obviously, it's just ingrained in house elf knowledge. Everybody knows house elves are inherently evil. Hello. Clearly. Clearly. <laughs> Mr. Crouch says that perhaps Mr. Diggory could be implying that he routinely teaches his servants to conjure the dark mark. (laughs) And then everybody gets super uncomfortable. (laughs) And Amos is just like, dude, that's not what I mean at all. (laughs) I love that. Like, well, that's what you said, guy. That's kind of what happened. (laughs) What are you implying here? Yeah, you might want to clear things up then. However... Crouch is a little bit nuts, and he just starts shouting at Mr. Diggory that he's accused two of the least likely people of conjuring the Dark Mark, himself and Harry Potter. (laughs) And doesn't he know the boy's story? Isn't he familiar with the proofs over his long career of detesting the dark arts and the people who practice them? Yeah, he says after he first accused Harry Potter of conjuring the Dark Mark. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But Mr. Diggory defensively says that he never suggested that Mr. Crouch had anything to do with it himself. And Mr. Crouch shouts that if he accuses his elf, he accuses him. When Mr. Diggory says that she could have picked it up anywhere, Mr. Weasley agrees and asks her where she found Harry's wand. Nice segue there, Mr. Weasley. Right? Mm Mm-hmm. He's so nice to her, too. Yeah. I love Mr. Weasley. She says she found it over in the trees, and Mr. Weasley said that whoever did it was clever enough not to use their own wand and must have disapparated right after casting the spell, leaving Harry's wand behind for Winky to find. Mr. Diggory asks Winky if she saw anybody, and she says she didn't. I buy it. I would believe that way sooner than I would believe the house elf conjured the dark mark. Right. (laughs) But Mr. Crouch asked Mr. Diggory if he can deal with Winky himself instead of her being brought in for questioning. He doesn't really like this idea, but Mr. Crouch assures him that she will be punished, causing Winky to become very afraid. He tells her that she has disobeyed him, and that means close. And we know from Chamber of Secrets that close means she's getting fired. Essentially. Mm Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> I just realized that Dobby got socked. <laughs> uh, two books too late. Right? <laughs> but Winky throws herself at Mr. Crouch's feet, begging forgiveness. And Hermione angrily tells Mr. Crouch that Winky had just been afraid and that she couldn't be blamed for wanting to get away from the people levitating the muggles, especially since she's afraid of heights. Right? I mean, that just is logic. Right. Mr. Crouch tells her that he has no use for a servant who is disobedient. Winky is just sobbing loudly and then a terrible silence falls over the group. Like, that's all just super like, what do you fucking say then? Well, that's super awkward. Yeah. Honestly. It was one thing when we saw Lucius Malfoy treating Dobby like shit, because you expect him to treat everybody like shit, because he does. Because he's a Nazi, Nazi von, von douchebag. douchebag. But to see someone who, you know, Percy spends all this time just glowing about how great Mr. Crouch is and how wonderful he is and all this, and now you see, no, he's a dick to his house elves too. Like, what the hell? And from what we know about him, this is clearly setting something else up. Mm -hmm. Oh, very obviously. And to leave all of that out mm -hmm. just gives so much more depth to the story. Right, because not a lick of this happened in the movie. Not a dicky bird. <laughs> no Mr. Diggory, no Winky, no Bagman, no Harry's wand being the guilty wand, no Prior and Cantato. Just a confused Harry wondering what Mr. Crouch means by crime. And Hermione finally gets a chance to answer his earlier question and explain that the symbol is the dark mark. It's his mark. Because, of course, Hermione knows exactly what the dark mark is. She read about it. Of course she did. Harry immediately says, What? Voldemort? And Crouch looks up at the sky. Harry also asks about the people in masks, wondering if they are his too. And Mr. Weasley nods, saying, Death Eaters. What do they do? They eat death. Demise consumers. Deceased devourers. Murder munchers. <laughs> <laughs> Murder munchers. That's exactly what I'm calling them from now on. Like forever now. Murder munchers. Murder munchers. I think we just found the episode title too. <laughs> nice. But anyway, in the movie, Mr. Crouch finally seems to accept that the 14-year-old didn't conjure the mark and asks everyone to follow him. Before he leaves, Harry lets him know about the man and points towards where he saw him. A man? Oh, my stars. Oh, my stars. A man. A man. <laughs> but that's about as close as it gets to how the book has them point out that it was a man's voice they heard mm -hmm. and how they pointed towards the trees where they heard it come from. Yeah, the Ministry Wizards all run off to investigate, I imagine, leaving Mr. Weasley behind with Harry, Ron, and Hermione. In the book, Mr. Weasley specifically says he's going to take his lot back to their tents and asks Mr. Diggory if Harry can have his wand back. Hermione is stuck staring at Winky, who's still sobbing, Aww. poor little elf, until Mr. Weasley urges her to come along with them. Movie doesn't have him head back to the tent. Probably because there weren't really any tents left to head back to, honestly. No, they were all past tents. God damn it. <laughs> Moving on. Mr. Weasley just asks Harry who the man was, and Harry says that he doesn't know since he didn't see his face. Had he been able to see his face, he would have recognized him from the dream that he had, mm -hmm. even though that's not how it happened in the book. It actually really bothers me that they included him in the dream and took out the winky scapegoat factor, because it just really killed that mystery for me. Yeah, I'd like to know what our keepers think about that, too. Powder pondering it is. Fact. But the movie scene ends with the trio and Mr. Weasley looking up at the dark mark as the snake continues to move around, protruding from the mouth of the conjured skull. And of course, the book chapter continues on a bit more. What? I know. Since the campsite wasn't fully burned down, they actually have tents to return to. They have present tents. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Ellen. Walking back, Hermione furiously goes on about how Mr. Crouch treated Winky terribly, that it wasn't fair, and it doesn't matter that she isn't human, she still has feelings. You know, I mean, for once, I actually agree with Hermione here. <laughs> it's rare, but it happens. And this is where, like, spew starts. Mm -hmm. Like, this is what ignites it in her, and I know they left all of that out of the movie, too, which we'll get to, but... yeah. This just really shows who Hermione is. Yeah. It's like her origin story. Right. It just sucks that they leave that out and they just kind of make her a bitch. I know. 
But Mr. Weasley agrees with her, and I love seeing that aspect of Mr. Weasley's personality as well. Mm -hmm. But he tells her that it isn't the time to discuss elf rights and asks where the others are. Ron tells him that they lost them in the dark and then asks why the skull is such a big deal. Mr. Weasley says he'll explain back at the tent, but they're stopped at the edge of the woods by a large group of witches and wizards who immediately descend upon Arthur when they see him, asking who conjured it and was it him? Him. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. And Mr. Weasley assures them that it wasn't him, that they aren't sure who it was because they disapparated right after, and that he just wants to get to bed. The masked wizards were all gone, but some of the tents were still smoking. Which is not quite the same as being completely burnt up. No. No. Charlie's peeking out of the boys' tent and asks what's going on. Ginny and the twins made it back, but the others hadn't. And Mr. Weasley says that he has them with him. Charlie. Charlie. Who was Charlie again? Ed Sheeran. Ah, yes. (laughs) That one. Gotcha. Bill, Charlie, and Percy were all in the tent nursing minor injuries. And Fred, George, and Ginny all seemed very shaken, but they were at least safe. It's understandable. I mean, that was a lot to go through. Especially when, in the book, they were woken up from that, too. Right. That would be very, very alarming. Mm Mm-hmm. Definitely. Bill asks if they got who conjured the mark, and Mr. Weasley tells them that they didn't, but they did find Barty Crouch's house elf holding Harry's wand. (laughs) Could you, like, what the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) Harry's wand? This is just a roller coaster from start to finish. Right? (laughs) And it does cause quite the commotion. Mm -hmm. And then Mr. Weasley, Harry, Ron, and Hermione fill him in on what happened in the woods. Which then causes Percy to go on about how Winky was getting what she deserves. (laughs) Damn it, Percy. (laughs) Percy is such a twat. Well, Crouch can do no wrong. I know. He's just a twat. Well, Hermione lets him know. Yeah. Snaps at him. Defends the house elf again. And actually, the two of them normally get along really well because they're typically both like... Oh, the rules. I was say they're both pretty similar. But they actually end up arguing about this before Ron interrupts, again asking what the big deal with the skull thing is, since it wasn't hurting anybody. I mean, but Hermione knew what it was. She knew that it was you know who symbol because hmm. she read about it in The Rise and Fall of the Dark Arts. Which was our trivia question. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mr. Weasley said it was what you know who and his followers sent up whenever they killed somebody. That seeing the mark above your house when you came home was everyone's greatest fear. But the symbol hasn't been seen in 13 years. Not that its sudden appearance now helps at all, that's for sure. No. Bill says the Death Eaters all disapparated when they saw it. They managed to catch the Roberts family before they hit the ground, and they're currently having their memories modified. Jeez, I would think so. I mean, I want my memory modified just for reading that. Yeah. Uh That would be really traumatizing. (laughs) Seriously. Harry asks what Death Eaters are. I think you mean murder munchers. Yes. Harry asks what murder munchers are. (laughs) Also known as supporters of You Know Who. Bill figures they had seen what was left of the ones who managed to stay out of Azkaban. Mr. Weasley hopelessly says they can't prove it was them, but it probably was. I mean, if it looks like the clan and smells like the clan... It must be murder munchers. Exactly. Ron said they had seen Nazi von Douchebag II in the woods, and he had all but admitted that his dad had been one of them. And everybody knows that the Malfoys were in with you-know-who. Like I said, if it looks like the clan and smells like the clan, it must be Nazi von Douchebag I. <laughs> <laughs> Harry asks about Voldemort's supporters and apologizes for using his name. Which does kind of get referenced in the movie when Harry says Voldemort after Hermione says it's his mark. Not that anyone, you know, really reacted to it, though. Yeah, it was definitely underplayed. It gets underplayed in the movies, like, a lot. Yeah. He then asks what the point of you-know-who's supporters levitating muggles was. Mr. Weasley explains that it's their idea of fun, and that half of the muggle murders when you-know-who was in power was just for fun. The ones who are still out probably had some drinks and thought it'd be a good idea to show everyone that they're still around. I mean, I gotta say, I've done some dumb shit when I drink, but (laughs) I've never held a white supremacist rally (laughs) drunk. And that's why we're friends. Yeah, it helps, that's for sure. I wouldn't even be friends with me if I had done that. (laughs) 
Ron asks why the Death Eaters disapparated when they saw the Dark Mark when they should be happy to see it. And Bill tells him that if they were Death Eaters, they would have had to work very hard and tell a lot of lies to stay out of Azkaban. They'd be more scared of you-know-who coming back than anyone else because they denied their loyalty to him. The feckless fucking cowards. Feckless fucking murder munchers. <laughs> Hermione asks if the Dark Mark was conjured in support of them or to scare them off, and Mr. Weasley says that her guess is as good as anyone's. He tells them that only the Death Eaters ever knew how to conjure the Dark Mark, so whoever did it was almost certainly a Death Eater at one point, even if they aren't now. So probably not, sweet little Winky the house elf. Right? Seems unlikely. Yeah. Mr. Weasley tells everyone they should get a few more hours of sleep so they can get an early port key back home, because if Mrs. Weasley has heard about what happened, she's going to be worried sick. Where have you been? I love Molly. I know. <laughs> Any excuse to say that line, I'm not going to lie. Right? I can't even begrudge you it. You do it so well. Aw, shucks, thanks. Harry gets back in his bed, and instead of being exhausted, he's wide awake and worried. Only three days before, he had woken up with his scar burning, and tonight, for the first time in 13 years, Lord Voldemort's mark was seen in the sky. He wonders what these things can mean, and thinks about the letter he wrote to Sirius, wondering if he's gotten it yet and when he would be likely to reply. There are no more fantasies about Quidditch and flying, and Harry lies awake for a long time before he finally dozes off. Yeah, a big old visit from the Santa clan will definitely do that. <laughs> yeah, the Ku Klux Claws. <laughs> <laughs> and this finally ends our book chapter, which is nothing like what happens in the movie. Barely the same scenes. Mm -hmm. But the gist was there, and it does leave us with a new actor to talk about. Mm -hmm. We meet Roger Lloyd Pack as Bartimius Crouch Sr., or just Barty Crouch. Or Mr. Crouch, if you're Percy. <laughs> <laughs> he was exactly how I imagined Barty Crouch to be. I did love him as Barty Crouch. The only thing, his accent threw me off. His accent almost sounded like... Which one of you conjured it? Which one of you did it? <laughs> like it, was it was very intense. It was, yeah. He was in an episode of Doctor Who that was pretty awesome. I'm going to have to rewatch it now because I didn't pick up on that. Mm -hmm. I normally love playing that game. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that doesn't have anything to do with Roger Lloyd Peck. Who is awesome. Yeah. Like we were saying, he did a fantastic job and actually was portrayed pretty accurately to how he was in the book yeah very neat hair the mm -hmm. suit the mustache it was all perfect yeah little hitlery it kind of worked <laughs> considering how he yeah. was acting mm -hmm. even though it was in contrast with what he actually stood for yeah but he was kind of like nazi-ish on the opposite end yeah he was like, like so anti death eaters he was just like another class of bad mm-hmm because they even mentioned that later on in the book, which we'll get to. So He was definitely the extreme of the other side. Yeah. For sure. And he played it really, really well. And it came off perfectly. Because you were kind of like, do we trust him? Wait. Like, what's wrong with this guy? Yeah. He seems suspicious. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get Percy's obsession in the movie about him to, like, play him up as this great guy either. We didn't get to see him be a dick to a house elf. Yeah. So all we had to go on was how he interacted with Harry. And it was just very, like, desperate and intense. And it clearly set up something wasn't right about him. Yeah. And I thought he played it well. He did very well on that. So yay! Good job, Roger. Mm -hmm. This will bring us to this week's Potter Pondering. What are your thoughts on how the movie just flat out showed us who conjured the Dark Mark, rather than giving us a scapegoat, like Winky was in the book? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. We really look forward to reading them, as always, because our keepers have some of the best answers to our Potter Oh, yeah. Ponderings. It's been amazing. Mm -hmm. This will bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Jamie Taft, who is in Ravenclaw, has a fur wood with unicorn hair core 11 and 3 quarters inches long wand, and has a white stallion Patronus. That's pretty badass. Right? Mm -hmm. Jamie writes, My mom read them to me when they first came out as a way to get me into reading. I was in second or third grade and I hated reading because I was horrible at it. I flip-flop between Ravenclaw and Slytherin. I say I'm 51% Ravenclaw, 49% Slytherin. 
I believe I would be a hat stall if Hogwarts was real. I feel that. If you have to be split between two houses, I bet you Jamie is fucking clever. I mean, that's where my split is. Yeah. I consider it so. Which is so funny because mine is Gryffindor Hufflepuff. Oh, Even yeah. though I'm like significantly more Gryffindor. Definitely you are. But you're... I would not be a hat stall. No. <laughs> There's no. <laughs> I'm like super Gryffindor. I might be a hat stall. You might be. Yeah. I might be. But green just looks better on me. So there's that. You've got enough Slytherin tendencies and I already <laughs> bought you the microphone pop cover. So <laughs> so there's that. You're sticking with green. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for sharing your sorting hat story with us, Jamie. Yes, thank you. And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your sorting hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. You can also just message us on social media. And now for the trivia question. What does the number 12 position of the Weasley clock say? The prize for the first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word, hashtag it's Weasley O'Clock, will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes. If you don't have an Apple account, you can write a recommendation on our Facebook page. Then email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. If you would like to support us as a patron for extra perks, you can go to patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. In addition to getting you some extra perks like Just Keep Rolling swag, patron-only Facebook groups, virtual meetups, bonus content, and more, your patronage also helps us continue producing this podcast, our cooking show, and bringing more content your way. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, monthly blooper reels, vlogs, and other random videos. And join us next week when we talk about Chapter 10, Mayhem at the Ministry, and the corresponding nope, because there aren't any. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just, just keep, keep rolling. rolling.